five for Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar for, on the NJC um, Local Government Pay. My name is Dina Leach. I'm the Vice Chair of the National Joint Council Committee, and um, I'm here to, as the Chair, this, and um, we'll be taking you through, yeah, just kind of like letting you know what, well, a few kind of like ground rules, basically. Um, I'm from Bright Brighton and Hove branch, and um, I've been on the National Joint Council NJC committee for quite a number of years now. So I'd like to um, just a few things actually. I'd like to say that uh, because it's a webinar, attendees will not be able to speak um, or share the webcams or see other attendees during the event, but you will be able to send any questions and answer, and questions and comments in the question and answer box, which is the um, the icon at the top there, the double um, question marks there. If you could, could you please keep questions um, short and clear? Because we'd like to answer anything that you actually need to know, because it's, this is very important. And also, I'd like to say that subtitles are available in English and Welsh. To switch them on, please click on the closed caption button on the right of the screen. So with just those kind of introductory comments, I'd like to um, pass this over to Mike Short, our national, one of our national local government officers. Mike is will be we're doing a um, he'll explain where we are with the pay, national pay and also there is a short presentation. So thank you very much and I'd like to hang over, hand over to Mike Short now. Thank you. Hi everybody. Thanks very much Diana um, and thanks to everyone for coming today. Yeah as Diana said I'm Mike Shorts. I'm one of the officers involved in the NJC pay negotiations and campaign and um, might remember me from doing a very similar presentation a few months ago. Um, so this presentation gives some of the background to the this year's pay claim and campaign and then updates you on the current consultation process. I'm currently sharing my screen and one of my colleagues will shout in my ear or something if you can't see the PowerPoint presentation I've loaded up. So I'm going to carry on as if you can all see it. Um, so that's that's the introductions. Um, just a bit of background first, because we've got members and activists here and people have different levels of knowledge of, of, of the NJC. So what is the NJC? Um, the NJC negotiates pay for England, Wales and Northern Ireland, not in Scotland. Not Scotland's not part of the NJC. The NJC pay spine is used by councils and schools to construct local pay grades. Every year, Unison and the other unions submit a pay claim to the local government association who represent the employers. Uh, the unions and employers then negotiate. If and when both sides come to a, an agreement, a settlement, um, then the pay offer, the, the pay settlement, uh, after uh, members are consulted, is applied to the NJC pay spine. London and a few other councils have their own pay spines, but if they follow the NJC pay uplift, they would apply the agreed increase to those spines. Various employers apart from councils also follow the NJC pay increase. A lot of academies, some private contractors, some charities and, and so on. OK, let's have a look at the, the recent context and background to our claim. Local government workers have kept the country going during COVID-19. Now, of course, we know how indispensable local government workers have always been, but the pandemic has made it much more obvious to the public. It's how our members in local government that have provided uh, works in sometimes risky situations, school support staff providing key worker schooling, uh, refuse collectors, housing workers and social workers who have continued to work in people's homes, uh, environmental health officers and many more besides. Now it's clear that councils have suffered financially due to the pandemic. They've lost lots of income, they've incurred lots of extra expenditure as the government has piled on more and more responsibilities onto councils because they know councils and, and their staff will deliver. Now, the government promised to do whatever is necessary, in inverted commas, to support them, but they didn't. The extra money the government has put in has been nowhere near enough. Our research shows that councils face a three billion pound funding gap for the next financial year. Meanwhile, 
Local government staff, our members, have lost up to 25% in the value of their pay over the last decade. For many years, members have had pay freezes and below, in, below inflation increases. Many of those suffering from low pay have been on the front lines dealing with COVID-19. Prices for everyday goods and for household bills keep going up. And the latest figures show that RPI inflation is 3.8%. We don't need more austerity. We need a decent pay award to begin to recover a lost decade of cuts, austerity and crisis. So, what was our claim? What did we ask for? Well, Unison and the other unions asked for a 10% increase on all pay points. We also submitted an attached conditions claim asking for a national agreement on home working policies and a home working allowance, a payment, a reduction of the working week to 35 hours and an equivalent reduction in the working week in London, minimum of 25 days annual leave from day one, joint work on mental health, and a review of maternity and family leave and family and pay provisions with very specific improvements. But Unison's focus throughout has been the pay claim because we believe that the most effective way to improve members' terms and conditions is to get them a decent pay increase. The 10% claim was very much the focus of our campaign and it continues to be. So what did the employers offer in response to our claim? Well, in May this year, the employers made an offer of 1.5%. We rejected this outright but we also entered into negotiations to secure an improved offer. At those pay talks, we made clear that we considered the offer to be insulting and explained why members needed and deserved more. In July, the employers came back with an increased offer, although it was a small increase. The employers made a final offer of 1.75%, as you can see here, and 2.75% for the lowest pay grade. I should clarify on the presentation here, it says plus 2.75. That's not that the people on the lowest pay Point, get 1.75 plus 2.75. They get 2.75 instead of 1.75. Um, on the conditions side, the offer also included commitments to uh, discussions on a joint framework guidance on homeworking, but no homeworking allowance, joint discussions on mental health, and that the employers said they would incorporate new statutory provisions on neonatal leave and pay. I'll come back to that. There was nothing on leave or hours, and it's also worth making clear that we had also called on the employers to campaign jointly with us to the central Westminster government for more money for local government pay. The employers refused to do that. OK, the next slide briefly, but this <laughs> compares what we asked for with what the employers have offered. You can see it spelled, spelled out just there. The next slide compares what we asked for on the conditions side with what we were offered on the conditions side. Um, we wanted a national agreement on homeworking and allowances for homeworking. They've talked to us about, uh, want, well, they, they said they want talks on a homeworking framework agreement. I think actually local authorities in many cases are really putting these agreements in place, um, but they, they said they wouldn't be a homeworking allowance. Um, we wanted a reduction in the working week. They said no. We wanted a minimum of 25 days leave. They said no. Although, again, I think a lot of authorities, you know, already have leave around that level. They, they did offer discussions on mental health supports. They did agree to complete the term time only review, which is something we'd said needed doing urgently. And um, as I said, they said they would incorporate statutory provisions on return to leave and pay. We should note that what that means is that there are new legal requirements around neonatal, neonatal leave and pay, and the employers have said they will put them into the green book. They basically had to do that, so it's not really much of an offer in that area. We did ask for a lot of other, a number of other things on maternity, paternity, and so on, leave and pay, which I won't go into. But if anyone does want me to ask a question, I'm sure we could do that if there's time. Um, this next slide um, compares members' current pay at 2021 levels to what their pay would be if this pay offer were implemented. Um, Obviously, members are still being paid at 2021 levels because the settlement day was the 1st of April this year, but we haven't settled, obviously. Um, if and when there is a pay settlement, that will be backdated to the 1st of April. But you can see some examples here. So someone on pay point one would get a bigger increase than the rest because of the nature of the offer. Pay point two, someone who earns a little over 18,000 a year, 943 an hour, would go up to 18,500, 960 an hour. 
Uh, if you look at someone who's on pay point 26, who's on just under 30 and a half thousand at the moment, 15, 78 an hour, they they would move up to just under 31,000, just over 16 pounds an hour. That's you know, 530 odd pounds cash increase. Um, for those of you who want to look at this in more detail, it's it's on the website you, for, for viewing or downloading. Um, just a, a word about Greater London. Members in London are covered by the Greater London Provincial Council, which has two separate pay spines for inner and outer London. It includes London waiting. Their pay is negotiated separately from the NJC technically, but in practice they usually follow the NJC claim and offer quite closely and that, that's what we think will happen this year. So they'll, they'll apply the final percentage to those spines. At the end of this presentation, again, there's a slide which breaks down some of the figures for Greater London, which you can you can look at separately if, if you want to. Well, Unison's NJC committee is our senior committee of members for NJC matters. Uh, the committee met on the 28th of July and agreed to launch a consultation of all members covered by the uh, by the offer to ask them to vote on the final offer. The committee agreed to strongly recommend that members vote to reject this pay offer. Now, members do need to remember that if they choose to vote to reject the offer, they would need to be prepared to take industrial action. We're clear that negotiations have gone as far as they can, and the bid for more money from central government, it's an ongoing campaign goal for us, but it's unlikely to result in immediate success. So the next step probably is an industrial action ballot. We should be clear why we think we need a strong reject vote. Members need a decent pay increase following years of real terms pay cuts. Members deserve a decent pay increase for all the reasons we've discussed. We need the UK government to fund it. The money is there. We've seen that with the money they put into contracts during COVID, um, the super rich. There are lots of ways of getting the money. The money is always there for the government when they want it to for their own interests. We want to send a strong message to the government that our members need and deserve this pay increase. That's why we're asking members to vote reject. Um, this slide talks you through the consultation process. In late August, a consultation pack was sent to Unison branches. It explained the background, the consultation process and the committee recommendation that members vote to reject. Resources to assist with the consultation were included. For example, template ballot papers and advice to help with consulting members digitally through online surveys. Um, a variety of campaign materials are also available, including leaflets, posters and social media resources uh, aimed at promoting and explaining the vote reject message. In many regions, this, the Unison region is working with branches to consult members. Um, branches and regions are sending information to members asking you to vote to accept or reject the pay offer. As I've said, and we will keep saying it, the committee is strongly recommending that members vote to reject. We're also engaging in a phone banking campaign to encourage members to, to vote. Uh, now, regions need their results finalised by the 24th of September. So what do members and activists need to do? Now, some of you here will be members, some will be activists, but um, uh, if you're a member, make sure your branch has your email address. Most of this consultation will take place through digital routes. The more people we can email, the higher the voting turnout will be. So please check your membership details are up to date. You'll be asked to vote to accept or reject the offer. And as I've said, the committee is recommending a reject. But either way, remember to vote. It's your pay and a high turnout means an accurate picture of members' views. If you're an activist, please help get the vote out. Ask members if they've received voting details. Um, ask them if they voted and encourage them to do so. Um, getting a reject vote is important, but the overall turnout is crucial as well. We need to be able to show the strength of feeling. And finally, next steps. Um, well, the consultation closes in late September, as I said. Um, after this, all the responses will be collated and the results will be considered by Unison's NJC committee when they meet on, it says early October, it's actually on the 1st of October. They will debate our next steps, they'll decide our next steps. Uh, now, the other two unions involved, the GMB and Unite, um, they've got similar timetables for consultation. Um, so once all three unions have their results, we'll, we'll get together to try and get a joint union position. Um, GMB and Unite are also recommending that their members vote to reject. Now, if the result is that members vote to reject, the most likely next step would be an industrial action ballot. As I've said, um, negotiations have gone as far as they can. I think uh, the employers said this is a final offer and the, our committee took the view that it really is a final offer. 
and you know as i said the we are campaigning and it's an ongoing campaign to get more funds for local government to protect services and jobs and also specifically for pay that's unlikely to bear fruit in the coming weeks if we're honest and so you know taking it to the industrial action ballot stage would be the next step um, and so obviously a clear result is crucial in the consultation and a high turnout is important as well um, that's all from me. Um, thanks very much for, for listening. I hope it's answered some of your questions, but obviously if you've got more, um, Diana and I are here to try and answer them. I'll hand back to Diana now. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Mike, and thank you for that very helpful presentation there. Um, there are a number of questions coming in, so I'll I'll just read them out and we'll decide, you know, between myself and Mike, who's going to answer them. So quest question one from Sam Randfield. What strategies, ta tactics are planned nationally in order to drive, well, I presume that means get that higher turnout, and how can branches most effectively support this? Mike, do you want to? Yeah. I mean, you have answered quite a lot in your presentation anyway, but just to kind of like, just bring it all together would be helpful. Of course, thanks. Well, the starting point is that we um, last year we had a big increase in uh, use of digital balloting to increase the turnout in the consultation. Um, that, that was partly driven by necessity because COVID meant we couldn't get to members in other ways. So this year what we're doing is we're sticking with the digital consultation while also asking branches and regions to get out there, talk to members as much as they can. And obviously where members, uh, we don't have an email address for members, paper balloting is available for those and you know it wasn't last year. So we should, we got a big increase in turnout last year on previous years, we'd hope to get an even bigger turnout this year. We are using the union's relatively new phone banking facility to contact members and I should stress that for those doing phone banking it's important because of data protection regulations that particular bit of our campaign can only be used to encourage people to vote, we can't use it to uh, promote a particular recommendation. Um, we're doing that through other means of course so the phone banking i think again will, will help drive up turnout i think we stepped up our game on social media now of course not everyone's on social media i accept but we, we've put out uh, a lot of uh, interesting you know new ways of doing things on on facebook and twitter which again will hopefully get more people involved um and uh I think I think beyond that, you know, the other thing I should say, sorry, is that we've got a series of all member emails going out, telling members, advising members to, to look out for balloting material from their uh, from their branch and region. OK, thank you. OK, thank you, Mike, for that, actually. Um, question from Mike Vaughan. Hello, Mike, uh, from Staffordshire General Branch. How do branches know which private sector employers follow the NJC pay agreements. This is an issue which many branches are not resourced to resolve. Yeah, that is quite an important one, Mike. Do you, yeah. you want to answer that, Mike? Yeah, sure. I mean, if, <laughs> there are lots of different answers to that question. Um, we did actually put out advice um, in March, I think it was, he says, you know, it's, and it's gone out a couple of times since, which was, um, it, it was a, a series of tests that we've, established with Thompson's, the, our solicitors, to establish whether, which you can apply to employers to establish whether they count as an NJC employer. And they give, there are different criteria. Uh, one is, uh, you know, I, off the top of my head, I'm not going to start repeating them all now, but, it, but it's around whether there's written proof, whether it's in a contract or a collective agreement or some other way of demonstrating that the, uh, that the employer could be included in an NJC ballot. Um, I think there, it is a very complicated matter and obviously for some of the very large employers they apply NJC pay increases in some contracts and not in others and, and that is something as a union I think we still need to get our heads round. Um, but I, I think if in doubt liaise with your regional organising staff who've got the tests and, and figure out whether, whether those tests um, apply in, in each case of each private contract so there's no easy answer unfortunately. Thank you, Mike. Um, the slide, I was going to say there's a question about slides here, but that's absolutely fine. Um, the, apparently there is a link that has been published in the question and answer chat. So if you want to use those slides for any uh, members presentation, it's there and, you know, by all means kind of use it, which is great. OK. Um, 
quite a useful question here. Um, will the proposed national insurance increase cancel out the offered pay increase for most members? Well, <laughs> Mike, do you want to just kind of like, I mean, I don't have the kind of rates in front of me, but I'm sure it will actually. But anyway, I'm passing it over to you. Is that OK? That's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I, um, I don't have the rates in front of me either. I, I think the announcement was being made at 12.30, so I was, it was, I was in direct head to head with Boris Johnson for who got more of an audience. I, I suspect it wasn't me, but um, so I don't know. I don't have the precise rates in front of me, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I I suspect it it would, you know, if national insurance goes up for everyone or everyone above a certain income level, I guess, then for those people, whatever rate it is, whatever rate is, is, is increased, you could take that away from what the local government pay offer is to, to get a sort of net uh, a net increase. I mean, it's, it was a difficult one because I think how we fund social care is, is a whole other debate. And I'm sure as a union, we, we're in favour of higher taxation, but we're, we're in favour of higher taxation to fund public services by taxing the super rich, not by taxing low paid public servants. Um, and that that would be our position, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, anything like a national insurance rate would cut into any increase in pay that people might get. And we would seek to use that in our campaigning, of course. Yeah. In fact, that's the sort of unspoken bit of the, <laughs> the question. Sorry, yeah, we would be making that clear it, for all of members across all the different sectors and service groups, because obviously it's across the board. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. You're absolutely right. I mean, we need to use that because <laughs> The person who asked that question, it will be taken out by the national insurance contributions. I don't know what figures the government is talking about, but I mean, I've heard what five five pounds a week uh, addition. So it clearly would most definitely. Um, just moving on here from Kate. There's a question about the phone bank banking. Who or how will we be carrying out the phone? Who or how who will, who will be carrying out the phone banking? I don't know about that, Mike, so I'm passing that over to you. Fine, yeah. Um, this is a hot topic. We're trying to resolve this today, actually. Um, regional organising staff are definitely doing phone banking. Um, whether we can open it up to uh, branches, uh, we're just trying to sort out whether that's possible at the moment. If it is open to branches, it would only be open to those branch people who have access to warms because that's the it's done through warms. So what watch this space? OK, thank you for that. Um, question seven for anonymous, but very use, useful one, actually. Given a lot of us are working from home, how effective might strike action be? Do you want to start on this, Mike, and I'll I'll pick this up as well. Sure, yeah. Um... Interesting, and I've, I've spotted, I don't want to jump ahead, but I have seen on the question answer, there are a few questions about the, the sort of types of strike action that might be uh, considered. So just the first thing to say about that is that decisions about what form of strike action that might be taken and so on um, are the property in the first instance of the NJC committee. So I think that would be something the NJC committee would uh, consider at its October meeting and subsequent meetings, obviously. And so things like whether, whether it's targeted action or or, or, that, or that sort of thing they would have to consider um, and I'm sure they would pay due mind to that question of people working from home as well. It would be interesting to hear from from you and them and from, from everyone really about what percentage are still working from home. I wouldn't want to give the impression that strike action would be in October because, um, because of uh, basically anti-trade union laws brought in by this, this current Conservative government there are a lot of hurdles before you can take strike action in terms of how long it takes. So it'll be some time before action could take place. And I think, I mean, who knows what's going to happen with COVID, obviously, every time we, th we think it's over, it's not over. But I think by the time uh, action could take place, we would hope that a lot of things would be back, more back to normal. Now, of course, there might well be new arrangements in a lot of authorities where people have new permanent or half the week or whatever hybrid homeworking arrangements. Um, I think there are good examples of in localised strike action that, that have taken place over the last year and a half um, and that some of you I'm sure in your branches have been involved in them. 
I don't think it's impossible. Obviously, it would present us with challenges and we'd have, have to think about how we get the message out there and make clear that if people are taking action, they are taking action, um, it, even if they're at home. And, and I think part of it is again about people not just sitting at home. It's about joining picket lines and that sort of thing and being active. Um, but I, th I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because it's, it's not my decision. It's the decision of our, of our lay, lay committee to make. I'm sure you have points to raise to add to that, Diana. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Mike, actually. I mean, we are in unusual times. However, we've stuck. This is our right to actually kind of like strike if we do get a reject um, enough people on turnout to reject. I mean, this this will be discussed, actually. But interesting, the next question um, is, a, is a useful one and is a more of a follow up one as well, actually, because if the response is to reject, which we clearly hope it will be, Will we be adopting the strategy that the Scottish region are using, whereby Pacific services will be called out on strike action and will they receive full take home pay, including pension contributions? Can I pass that over to you, Mike, to start and I'll, I'll finish sure. off as well. The short answer is, is don't know. We, I mean, we would, we would, uh, you know, the NJC committee would make the decisions. They would make a request to the NEC's Industrial Action Committee, and, you know, we would present them with with evidence of how things have gone in other disputes. And the Scot Scottish local government dispute is obviously very current, and we'll we'll, be, we'll all be watching eagerly to see how how it's how it goes and 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 so on. It, so that's certainly one option. It's not wouldn't be for me to say whether it's the best option or whether you know whether targeting particular groups is the best option or whether it's everyone or some combination. We present the, the, the arguments and the, and the different uh, evidence to the committee to make their decision. Uh, strike pay, again, that, that, that's a matter for the Industrial Action Committee and, and a request would need to be made, basically. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. I think it's, um, I haven't got a great, amount of details from from um, from Scotland, but from what I've actually heard is is that they're being extremely focused in relation to taking out, you know, or agreeing to take out, you know, sort of school cleaners, you know, bin operatives, you know, those things that, you know, are clearly kind of like very visible services, which could have a serious effect on kind of schools, whether schools will be open. And a whole lot of other things as well, actually. But I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, um, Scotland is slightly ahead of us. So basically, you know, we just need to see and, you know, but also, in fact, it's important that, you know, we do as far as possible, try kind of like and do this kind of like together, if not immediately the same time scale. But it, we are looking and learning. OK. Um, There, there's a question here, it's um, from Anonymous again, but the request for a 10% pay increase would appear to be very unlikely following the challenges of the pandemic. Would this perhaps have been more realistic to have sought 5% 5, 5 and then the, then the negotiation would be more achievable to both parties' position? Well, I think it's fair to say that if you, I'll start with this, Mike, is that okay? I think it's fair to say that 10%, we did talk a lot in great detail on the committee. I think what people have to realise that with pay austerity, this has been going on since, well, since way before 20, 2010, and the amount that has actually already been lost as a result of the mini school kind of like pay increases that we have received over this period of time, 10% was the kind of like figure that we absolutely needed to be kind of like aiming for. I mean, it was up to the employer then to come back with a better offer, but well, they did slightly, but at 1.75%, that's clearly not enough. If they had come back at 5%, well, we might not, it, we, who knows? We might not have actually be in this sit, um, situation. But I think it's fair to say that this time, unlike any other time, all the committee regions, the regions of um, England, Wales and Northern Ireland were all singing from the same, same um, song sheet that basically they strongly disagreed and and wanted to reject, whereas that has that did not happen last time. I think people have reached the point now where they absolutely deserve the 10 percent. 
So that's my bit on that one. I'm going to pass that over to you, Mike, if you want to add any more points to that, actually. No, um, not not really. I mean, well, I'll, I'll just emphasise that it was a decision made by the the committee whose representatives who are elected in their regions. So it represented that view and, and it was a long discussion. There were different options put forward uh, and that, that was the decision came to. But, but the, I think Diana's explained very well what, what the reasons were for that decision. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, there's another question here from Mike from Staffordshire General Health. Uh, sorry, General Branch. If we receive a positive vote for industrial action, I assume we will look at targeted action across certain service. Unison rightfully have raised strike pay commitments and hopefully paid dividends here. OK, I presume you're talking about their Mike um, disaggregate. Ballots. I presume he's talking about disaggregate ballots there. What do you think? Can I pass? Uh, Mike, is that OK? Can you look at that and I'll sure. finish that one? Sure. I, I mean, I think that's covered similar ground to a couple of the other questions. Um, I, you know, decision. I mean, there are various options, aren't there, with, with industrial action. You could just ballot everyone and have all out strikes of however many days. Um, you can do selective action, which is where you ballot everyone, but then you put out different bits or you can you can do targeted where you you, you, you ballot particular services or occupations. Uh, you mentioned disaggregated ballot style. That's where you, you you know you have separate ballots for different places so you can get a yes vote in one place and no vote in others. Uh, the, these are all options which are on the table to be considered. I'd say we're not there yet. We're at the moment majority of our energies are focused on getting the maximum turnout in the consultation and promoting that reject vote but we are preparing for a discussion at the NJC committee on the 1st of October where they can begin that debate. Um, and at the same time, we are preparing the groundwork in case there needs to be an industrial action ballot. We are preparing the groundwork in terms of the data cleansing of all our membership records and all that sort of thing. So that's all ongoing. Um, the particular the particular details of how an industrial action ballot would, would work and what we'd be asking, we haven't got there yet. And that would be something the committee would discuss. Thank you, Mike. Um, how will the NJC decide on regional returns when they meet on the 1st of October? Well, we can answer this actually. I mean, each region sends a list back to the NJC committee and where basically they, you know, they will list the, the re, you know, the branches that have actually kind of accepted the recommendation or rejected. So basically we'll look at that. I mean, let I think with a strong recommendation from the committee to reject this time hopefully they you know we should come out with um with a, a pretty substantial kind of reject vote well that's what we're hoping for um i don't know mike i don't think there's anything more to add to that actually but i'll just go on to the next question from bob cole where does the 3.8 inflation figure come come from uh, mike, should I yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I saw a couple of questions about this. Um, it's the current RPI inflation rate. There, there are various inflation uh, rates used. The uh, and the R RPI one is higher. Um, um, and we think it's it's right to use that higher rate because it includes housing costs. For years, we had this thing with the government where they they switched from RPI to CPI, and CPI didn't include housing costs. Now, housing costs are a major part of the expenditure our members have to make each month. So to to have a measure of household spending that doesn't include spending on the actual housing, whether it's mortgage payments or rents, was just ridiculous. So we, we continue to think RPI is the best. Now it's true that there is now a, a, a still new newer measure called CPIH, which I think C stand, the H stands for housing, um, but we continue to think that RPI is, is the fairest measure of what the inflation that our members are experience, experiencing. But you're, uh, the question is right, so that it, that isn't the one that you will see mostly in, in the press and media. Uh, I believe you're muted, Diana, at the moment. All right. It was inevitable. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, absolutely. But that's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, how can we quickly differentiate the senior man? Oh, sorry, I 
Oh no, that's right. No, this is a question. How can we quickly differentiate the senior manager grades on, on warms so we can filter them out during the ballot? Now, I, I'm definitely going to have to pass that on to you, Mike. Yeah, you sold me that one, didn't you? Um, well, the short answer to, to that, how can we quickly differentiate them is, is I'm not sure that we can. I mean, it's it's a major issue, this. Um, now, in the past, we have been basically, uh, for, and this has been covered legally in both the consultation and industrial action ballots, been able to include chief officers and senior managers in our NJC consultation, our NJC uh, industrial action ballot. Uh, the reason being that for the most part, the local government bargaining groups, aside from the NJC, basically follow what the NJC does. They're, they're, they're strongly influenced by them. So, for example, you may you may have heard that the the youth and community JNC employers offered a 1.75% increase the other day, and it, it was it was clear that they were always going to do that. It's a bit more complicated this year because the chief officers JNC employers side have only offered 1.5%, and we've got pay talks with them next week, and we would hope to get that up to 1.75% at, at the very least as a starting point, you know. Um, but they they do seem to be making noises that it's a final offer, so it does beg the question, can we really include the chief officer and senior manager members in an NJC exercise? I, there is no easy way to do it. And the problem is that in, in most local authorities, you will have different pay spine arrangements for senior managers. Um, sometimes the pay spine is being extended, so you may, you may have to do it on what their pay spine is, but I think it will rely on local knowledge to a degree. And I'm sure, so, sorry, that I can't be more helpful than that. Chief officers, a bit easier to separate them. Not, not not easy, but a bit easier because uh, the chief officer's JNC defines a chief officer as an individual who is the director or head of a service or their deputy. So that gives us a bit of a stronger way forward for identifying those members. Um, but I, I'm afraid I don't have the easy or quick answer to that question. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. That's great. That's great. Um, there's a question here from Leanne Dallimore from Carfilly Branch. What will be our approach for industrial action if we get a majority reject vote? Well, I can say, I can say if we get a majority reject vote, we will be jumping up and down actually on that committee, I can assure you actually, because that will then give us the mandate to actually seriously look at an industrial action, you know, a formal industrial action ballot, which will be great. I don't know, Mike, if you've got anything more to add to that, to Leanne's question there. No, we've, we, I've, I've advised on the, the next steps in terms of the practicalities, so yeah, nothing's bad, thanks. Right. One day strike, one strike day a week worked for the RMT a few years ago. Are we considering this? Mike, do you want to? Just kind of like, well, well, actually, quickly, sorry, I do I do beg your pardon there, Sam, because Sam switch switching between Mike and myself. The question, those are kind of issues that will be discussed on the 1st of October, depending on the consultative ballot. I mean, that's great that it worked for the RMT. I, the question is, I don't know. I don't know what we'll be considering. It depends on a whole lot of majority of decisions, you know, a lot of decisions, basically, you know, and what the committee members, you know, feel that that, can, that you know, they can, they feel will be most effective, basically. Do you want to add any more to that, Mike? No, thanks. OK. A uh, question here from Paul Clark in Leicester. Presumably all non-office members will automatically be offered paper strike ballots if we get to that stage. Yeah. Sh shall I answer that, Diana? Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. I, I should we should be clear about this. All the stuff I was saying about digital consultations and surveys was about the consultative phase. Any formal industrial action ballot would be all paper ballots to home addresses. Um, under the law, that's what we have to do. So that, yeah, whether you're office based or, or, or not office based, you would get a paper ballot asking you uh, to vote on industrial action. There's no other way of doing it. I mean, there's there's a whole load of arguments about whether we should be allowed under the law to do digital 
you know, electronic balloting for industrial action ballots. I'm sure we get a higher turnout if we did, but but we're not allowed to at the moment. So the answer to your question is yes. OK. It's on the, thank you. There's another question here from Mike Vaughan. Um, targeting the staff working directly with service users rather than those working from home would have more impact. Well, yeah, absolutely. Kind of like Mike, we would we would agree with that, actually. Um, and that's why there needs to be a major discussion about what is the most effective kind of like strategies to kind of adopt here, actually. I don't think you've got, have you got anything more to add to that, Mike? No, thanks. OK. Um, another anonymous question here. I'm fully behind Unison. Well, that's great to hear and what they stand for, but industrial action will never have the desired outcome. Services plan for this, members still going to work, and over the recent years, it has never affected outcomes that much. Well, and it's true to say that a national ballot is not an easy one to win, but basically having had the small and minuscule kind of like pay offers that we've actually had over the number of years, I think now is a time to actually kind of like think quite seriously about an effective kind of national strike. I think that in line with what's happening in the NHS, what's happening in, you know, Scotland, these are kind of like, you know, these will help kind of like other, our members to actually kind of like, you know, so we're looking at, doing this all together potentially, although it, on a different time scale, you know, I understand that actually, but I think I disagree with that kind of like comment there basically. I think, you know, if we look back, I know we have to go back some way to look at that, but the pensions kind of issue, you know, the, and other kind of like, you know, threats of industrial action where we've actually had an effective kind of like, you know, number of turnout. I mean, I think it's 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 quite important, the turnout of this, actually. And that's why we're trying to increase our turnout for this consultative ballot, because this is the start. Mike, I don't know if you want to add any more question, any more points to that, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I did not. I, I agree with everything Diana said, but I, I would just add that um, we are, you know, we, we, no one's saying it will be easy or we, no one's saying that industrial action will be easy. No one's saying it's an easy choice for people to make when they vote. And also I'd emphasize we're not there yet. We're still at the consultation phase. Um, and we we'd consider all those questions. Well, the NJC committee would consider all those questions carefully. And if we were doing it, we would we would need a big persuasion effort and a big communication effort to, to get people on board. OK, thank you for that, Mike. Another question here, well, it's on similar kind of like, you know, veins, but realistically, do you think we can get any better than the NHS of 3%? Well, as far as I'm aware, the NHS are also going through a consultative ballot at this moment in time. So I don't think that is actually a done deal at all. And I think it's fair to say that in Scotland, the NHS were offered 4%. So, um, Yes, I think we. It would be very different if the employees had come back with a more realistic kind of offer. The fact is they've come back with 1.75%, which is clearly not enough. Mike, I don't know if you want to say any more about that, actually. No, I think you've, you said it all. Thanks. OK, all right. OK, moving on. Would the NJC pay increase Demand of 10% apply to all council employees, including managers and senior leaders. Oh, yes, it's clearly. Um, should I say a bit more on that? Um, yeah, well, uh, well, you have already kind of like talked about chief chief officers pay and stuff, but yeah. Go yeah, on. I mean, we, 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 set, we submitted a separate pay claim for the for chief officers, um, which it wasn't quite straightforward as just saying we want 10% for chief officers, but it said basically we want equivalent to what NJC settled with. Um, and in the past, normally, you know, chief officers do get the same percentage increase as those on the NJC. But as I said before, the, they've only had a 1.5 offer this year, so it's slightly lower. But we have got pay talks coming up with the employer's side of the chief officers on Monday. So it, what, it, we'll, we'll update branches as soon as we have more information on that. Thanks, Mike. 
I'm just leading on. Apathy, this is the question actually. Well, it's more like a statement really actually. Apathy is the biggest problem Unison faces. The government have effectively ground workers down, leaving workers with very little hope that things will change. Until we can change this, I can't see things changing. Well, well actually, I think this is the point of a change. This is kind of like a time when we have all committee members on the NJC strongly recommending to, re to reject the 1.75% pay offer and putting you know, this to the kind of like members. We would hope that members, having had the lead from the NJC committee, will, and this, is, this has not happened for some time, that we will basically, you know, be able to kind of like galvanise workers, our members into, into basically kind of like also kind of rejecting the pay offer. So whilst apathy is not, I mean, I think we start with kind of like clear messages from the, from the NJC committee and also from our branches. So it's down to a kind of our activists to actually get this message out and for the majority of kind of members to vote. That is the start. Mike, I don't know if you've got any more comments on that one. No, thanks. No, nothing to add. OK, all right. Question from Bob Cole. For staff leaving before an agreement is reached, would they get retrospective payment? Well, that's. Yes, that's quite simple to kind of like do, but um, they'd have to kind of like contact you have to contact the kind of employer, you know, that you've left and actually kind of like, you know, ask for that, basically. I, it's not something that would actually be given automatically. So, yes. Um, moving on, it, it's, it's really good. I don't know how many more questions I've actually got. Oh, I see John Burgess is down there, actually, but I've got a question here. It's anonymous. Our bin workers are keen to take strike action here in Barnet over pay. We have more, made loads of videos of them rejecting the offer. Well, that's great. That's great. I, I mean, I, I think the most important thing is that um, Unison is one. Well, it's quite a large part of the NJC. I mean, our other sister unions, the GMB and Unite. I mean, here in Brighton, here in Brighton Hove, most of our bin operatives are actually with the GMB. So it would be very helpful and useful to actually have, you know, a rejection from all three three unions that that would to me would be amazing actually a high turnout rejection from all three 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 unions and we and we can kind of go so yeah so that would be good mike i don't know if you've got any more right okay right john right john burgess why not what's the earliest date strike action could start it's a question we are being asked that's a very very in, very useful question thank you john um Mike, I know we have spoken about this on the committee, but we haven't actually kind of drilled down the exact date, but we know roughly when it might actually be. Could you just say a few words about that? Yeah, happy to. Um, the first thing I'd say is that we, that we, we're working in the background with our the people who organise our ballots and so on about what might happen. And it, there are so many caveats and qualifications. I wouldn't want to give a firm date. We'd be looking at, I think, towards the beginning of 2022, but the kind of what form of action we take, who we ballot, those kinds of questions could all have an impact on how quickly we can get the ballot done. So uh, I think it's those and those are questions the NJC committee will need to consider when they have their discussions on the 1st of October. Um, I don't know if I can just sort of not abuse my position while I've got the, got the floor, but I noticed a comment or question earlier where someone said, how will regions and branches get to give their views into that process and I just wanted to reassure with this I, I don't I mean Diana you'll correct me if I'm wrong but I don't think it's the case that every decision will be made in cast iron on the 1st of October if there's going to be a long industrial campaign then there'll be various meetings of the NJC committee and they'll obviously we'll make sure I mean NJC committee reps um, should and do seek the views of, of branches and members in their regions before going to the NJC committee so there's, there's there's a full process of making sure we have sort of bottom to top, uh, you know, lay democracy in, in this decision making process. Just, want, just wanted to emphasise that. Thanks. No, that's great. No, that's great, Mike. Thank you for that, actually. I'm just waiting for the bar. <laughs> OK. Um, I th is, um, there's a question here about 
um, well, I think we have addressed it before, but I mean, it's basically talking about um, would it be more effective to target more um, impactful groups, i.e., you know, strikes of IT staff? Um, I think we have kind of like really answered that one. That's that's a discussion that we would be dealing with at the you know at the committee stage basically. But I think it's fair to say that if you have any you know if you've got ideas as a branch as a member, I think it's important to kind of filter them into your kind of like you know your regional local government committees, and 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 let and you know send and send those off to your regional you know NJC reps. I mean, I'm one rep from the Southeast region, so if anybody is on this call and they've got ideas, I'm more than happy, you know, for, the, for you to come kind of like directly, but seek out your NJC reps and make sure that they've actually got as much information as possible, um, you know, from you. But I, I mean, I think it's true to say that we need to think of different ways of actually doing this. We do need to look at strategies. We're quite, we're well aware of that in the committees. So, you know, as much information as possible. So get so get it, you know, just get it back to the committee by the 1st of October or kind of onwards from the 1st of October as well, actually. Um, I don't think there's anything more to say about that, Mike, so I'll just go on to another question, actually. I'm just sorry, just. Um, um, there's a question here for Anonymous. Can the government withdraw the pay offer at any time, delaying things, getting close to autumn spending review? Mike, do you want to just start with that one? Thanks. It's a really interesting question. So, you know, going back a few months, the talk was all about the public sector pay freeze, which the government announced. And what we've seen gradually in each sector is that a lot of the most of the employer sides have a gone against that and um, obviously <laughs> I'm not saying the 1.75% offer is good we've we've we're recommending people vote to reject it but what's happened is that those parts of the government which are directly controlled by the government the civil service and sort of non-departmental bits related to the civil service they are being offered in inverted commas a 0% pay increase in other words they're having a pay freeze in, imposed let's call it call it what it is um, but in local government the offer hasn't come from the government it's come from the local government employers, which is, you know, done through the local government association, but it's got representatives on there of actual local authorities, as well as the local government associations of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So the government itself can't withdraw the offer. Um, it's possible that the employer side could withdraw the offer, um, but I don't think they would. And, and the, the questioner mentions the awesome spending review. I'm pretty sure that the local government employers made us this paltry offer on the basis that they don't expect to get much out of the autumn awesome spending review. Um, I think it's so. So I don't think they would have any justification for drawing it if they're not happy with what comes out of the spending review. I think it's more likely from a campaigning perspective. We'd be saying, hang on, you've got all this money now. We need a better offer. It could be, in other words, the spending review could give us yet more ammunition for our arguments that the pay offer should be higher. So yeah, and technically the offer could be withdrawn, but I don't think the local government employers would do that. And it, it would lead to the breakdown of national bargaining and all sorts of things. Mm. Thanks. OK, Mike, um, this is more a state. This is more a statement, basically, but it's um, from anonymous. Wouldn't a national strike be more effective if we just shut down services, service for services? Even one day of this would demonstrate how vital people are as they wouldn't they couldn't access tools unless they fall back to paper also whoever the pe person is i saw the unison video showing people turning to ash i felt the shock factor from that and i'm sure others will it was very effective <laughs> right okay interesting i haven't seen that particular video actually i will chase it out actually that sound, that looks really good actually but very kind of like useful yes mike i don't know if you want to kind of like add any more to that but uh no but just to say uh uh the member of our team at unison center who designed that video is the simon who you're hearing quite a few, <laughs> you're hearing about in the background but you haven't seen on the screen and so we should I, I it's a great video so well done simon and it does i think show you know, it, it, it helps show the public, you know, what local government does and what communities would look like if local government weren't there or if, you know, 
we didn't have the workers to do it or you know we couldn't recruit the workers to do it because their pay is so low. Okay, okay. I think, well, we've answered quite a number of kind of like questions and comments there, Mike, actually. Um, and we've got five minutes of the agreed time that we allotted for this webinar. So I just want to um, say a few closing words, actually. I want to initially thank, thank people for attending. I think that is very, really important. I do hope that you've actually got something out of this in the way that we have as well, actually. It's a two way process. I hope that you will um, look at the campaign website, which is unison.org.uk. It's a local government fair pay link. Also, just keep an eye out for any um, updates um, by emails to, you know, to members, encouraging kind of like people to, you know, all members to actually um, partake of the kind of like consultation that's going on at this moment in time. And um, and encourage any any other members of your branch as well to also kind of take take part. The greater the turnout, the more you know, the more clout we've actually got here. And it, I can't stress that enough. Actually, we absolutely need to have a major turnout here. Actually, we've now given a strong lead. We hope that branches and all activists and all members will actually partake and actually kind of like give us you know, give us the rejecting vote that we actually kind of need in order to take to take this further on behalf of all members in local government. And want to, Mike, I don't know if you want to say any kind of like last words actually before I say bye bye. But anyway, thanks, Lena. No, just to thank you very much for your chairing and to encourage everyone to vote. And also, yes, so I. Please vote. Get everybody else you know to vote. Look at Simon Jackson's video. That's clearly that sounds a great, a great one actually. And thank you for actually taking the time here out of a busy, your busy day. And I hope um, that you find this useful as well. Thank you. Bye bye.